for a brand new episode of The Witching Hour. Some of you out there might be listening to us in podcast form, which uh, is a wonderful way to enjoy the show, <laughs> but some other people might recognize we're back on video regularly. Yeah. Whether we have a guest or not, we are going to do uh, video episodes going forward on the Collider Live channel. So you got two great options to experience some Witching Hour. I am Perry. This is Haley. Hello. What's up? How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm I'm freaking flying right now. Yeah, I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm so happy it's over. I'm so happy the marathon's over and that I achieved my goals. My goal was just not to walk. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy that I didn't walk. Good for you. Do you know how many people were dressed as blow up T-Rexes along the race route saying like with signs that says uh, T-Rex likes hugs or like high five ah. T-Rex for a power up or something like that. That's nice. People That's were very creative. In the middle of like desperately wanting to be entertained, I'd assume. Oh, you have no idea. Yeah. You, ha I would have looked any which direction for <laughs> some source of motivation, especially from 18 on. You've been away for quite a while I though. Have, have, yes. you, have you had a wonderful trip? I did, I always do. I went to Portland for my, my soul keeping retreat where I go see my friends and their kids and enjoy the, the the leaves, they change colors. Isn't it in incredible? In foreign lands yeah, outside yeah. of California. Where I was in New York, you could see the drastic shift from, and I was back there just a couple of weeks ago, but it's entirely different. Like beautiful oranges that totally yeah. signify Thanksgiving and fall is here. Yeah, it's amazing. I love it. I go up there for Halloween and it's always um, a joy, a true joy with filled with beautiful Portland food. What did you do for <laughs> Halloween there? Uh, what did we do? I got very drunk. That's what I did. <laughs> okay. I dressed up as uh, the main character in Russian Doll, and I acted accordingly. You were wonderful in that Thank costume, you. too. <laughs> I loved that. That was not the only Russian Doll costume I saw, nice. too. I, uh, there were a couple out there. And it's an that's, easy outfit. You can do it with mostly what you own and a red wig. It is so, <laughs> so true. Um, I didn't really, I didn't really do all that much yeah, you because pre-marathon. Well, it was also because my my plan was to watch scary movies on the plane. Because usually, what I do when I take the red eye is I stay up the entire yeah. time because it lands at like five, six in the morning, and then I could just go home and sleep it off for four hours and then have a whole day ahead of me. But my flight wound up getting delayed for three yeah. hours, so I basically just sat on my couch twiddling my freaking thumbs for God knows how long until I actually went to the airport. And by the time I got there, I had to sleep on the plane. Because because once I got to New York, I had to go to the race expo. So mm -hmm. not too many uh, Halloween celebrations in the evening. But I'm pretty sure the Pteranodon costume on Movie Talk made up for it all. Oh, that because, was a beautiful thing. Yeah, I'm not going to forget that episode anytime <laughs> soon. So we're going to call this episode of The Witching Hour right now our Halloween hangover yeah. episode. Where, you know, kind of like we, we recover and... Something that usually happens to me right when, it usually happens specifically when I have to change my Twitter avatar and page back to normal. I get the Halloween's over blues uh, and yes. it makes me really sad, but there's no reason to feel that way because just because Halloween comes and goes doesn't mean horror movies stop and it no. doesn't mean you have to stop celebrating spooky stuff. So we are gonna dedicate this episode to all the good spooky stuff that are on the horizon. Yeah. I, I understand the Halloween blues or the post-Halloween blues. I don't suffer from them because I, I think that this is a lot of credit to Mr. Henry Selleck. Uh, the Nightmare Before Christmas made it all one long season so for me. So true. Like, uh, it's like, oh, Halloween's over. But now it's Christmas time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, I get so hype. And like we listen to Christmas music while we cook on Thanksgiving. So it's all just one big messy wonderful I, thing i do really like like the blob of holiday yeah. season which <laughs> starts with halloween exactly. and ends with new year so we still have a whole bunch of celebrating to do yes. but in case you are kind of itching for more horror releases you are in luck because at the time that you are listening to this episode if you listen to it the day it drops dr sleep hits theaters tonight Thursday night at specific times. And if you're uh, watching us on video, it's already out for you to enjoy. So we're gonna do a little Dr. Sleep highlight right now. And I, I think there's no better way to kick it off than the first of us who experienced the movie because Haley got to watch it in the coolest possible way. Oh yes, I was very lucky. Um, for the 
I don't know. It's weird to it's like for a junket because you did a subsequent mm-hmm. junket like a week later. So you can't say the junket. Grammar. Yay. <laughs> um, for a junket, they sent uh, us. <laughs> I'm going to start saying that. <laughs> yes. They sent us to Estes Park, Colorado, where we got to stay at the Stanley Hotel, which oh, is where I'm so jealous. Stephen King stayed when he wrote the book. And it also, as it turns out, I learned while I was there, is where um, Mike. Flanagan and Katie, Katie, oh, my brain, uh, his wife and Siegel. leading actress, Katie Siegel, wrote Hush together in that same hotel. What? Uh, yeah. Um, Creates and more it's urgency a, for me to go there. It's very cool. Uh, I was telling you, it's like it's a terrible hotel. Like, it's uncomfortable to sleep in. It's too cold. The water doesn't get warm. It is all just awful things to provide. There's no room <laughs> service. Doesn't matter. Not why you're there. Yep. You're there for the history, and if you are a believer of ghosts, you are there for that, the possibility of an encounter. It's. Uh, Did you have any? No, I'm not the person, though. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I kind of mentioned this on our, our Halloween episode over at I Like Scary Movies. I'm not, I don't put out receptive vibes, and I don't, I don't believe or disbelieve in ghosts. Mm-hmm. I think that it's sort of like aliens, which is like, who knows, probably. <laughs> um, and I just, but my general vibe is like, Nah, we good. Thanks. Okay. I'm how do, how do I make myself it. open? Maybe I'm not open to it enough? Is that why they're not coming to me? I don't know. You'd have to ask a medium. Yeah, and my whole life has been like, we good. I'm not looking for a, that. That'd be a cool interview to do on the show. Yeah, like bring in cool. a medium. I would love to talk to one. I'm fascinated by all that. But I'm equally fascinated with that hotel that I've been dying to go to for way too many years now. It's very cool. It's very cool. It was very cold. Um and they do like okay so my favorite thing about it i was like which which direction do i want to go right now but my favorite thing about it is it's built on a mountain that's full of like quartz so like if a place was going to be powerfully haunted it would be one that is built upon like a mountain of crystal yeah um i thought that was really interesting and But then it's also like it's built on a mountain of quartz. And literally, if you go down in the tour, you can see like jutting rocks everywhere. And so when things shift or doors close, you're like, well, you built it on a mountain that's changing all the time. I don't know. The skeptic in me is very hard to defeat. Um, It's interesting. It's just it's fascinating. So that that it's not even that the skeptic in me is hard to defeat. It's that both sides of me are always at war. There's a side of me that's like, well, yeah, it would be on a quartz mountain. And the side of me is like, you built it on a freaking mm-hmm. mountain. What do you expect? So wait, just clarify this for me. So the Stanley is where he wrote it. Yes. Not Nothing was shot there. No, the the miniseries, the 91 miniseries yeah. was shot there. Okay. And then the exteriors of The Shining were the Timberline. Correct. And okay. The interiors were on a soundstage. Yes, yes. Um, but it's very cool. Anyway, we saw the movie. We went down to the local theater that is also supposedly haunted. Um, and we got to watch it there. And then I got to talk to Mike Flanagan and his producer, Trevor Murphy, the next day. And um, those were very fun conversations. They're both big, huge Stephen King nerds. Mm-hmm. So it was a lot of fun to to dig into that with them. So because we've both seen the movie at yeah. this point, we're not going to spoil anything. This is a non-spoiler review. I already did a brief non-spoiler review with Riley, but I can talk about Dr. Sleep <laughs> all day, all night. And we think you need a witching hour review. Yeah. So we are going to I share. I need to review it for goodness yeah, sake. We want to know what Haley thinks <laughs> specifically. So Haley, where did you land on Mike Flanagan's Dr. Sleep adaptation? I like it a lot. Um, it's, I need to see it again because I was not expecting it to be quite as different from the book as it ultimately is. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are things that I kept expecting to happen that just aren't in the script they yeah. wrote. And that's, I think, ultimately, almost across the board, I would say really smart changes that that enhance the story for the film format. Mm-hmm. But it just expectation is a hell of a thing. And I, I want to see it clear of that, knowing already, like, all right, this part of the book you really, really love is not going to happen. You come to terms with is it. Is there anything you on. could specifically name that wouldn't be a major spoiler that isn't in the movie that you missed? Momo? I'm torn on Momo. Mm. There was a Momo mention. Yeah, that's not the same thing at all. No, no, it's not the same thing at all, but it's like that's a scene that I think could have come out of the movie entirely. Mm. Like you just didn't, you didn't even need to bring it up. It didn't feel like for fans of that character from the source material, it didn't feel like, 
like it did anything for me. Yeah. I'd rather it have not been there at all. Mm -hmm. It felt like a device to get um, the mother out of the house. That makes sense. I think it's also just to like, I think they were very intentional to give book fans things throughout. Like, oh, I think they gave book fans a major thing. Oh, I don't even know how to ask what you're talking about without spoilers. Yeah, um, there there is um, a way that I think Flanagan, because one of the big uh, points of conversation with the Doctor Sleep adaptation is, well, what is it? Is it a sequel to the book or a sequel to the movie? Yeah. And I think that is one of the smartest thing Flanagan does with scripting this is he manages to make it both yeah. in a way that not only did I find very satisfying, but as a big fan of everything, I, I just greatly appreciated it. Mm -hmm. He did very good work. It's clear they were equally obsessed with both and took both in high reverence. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I like it a lot. I do, like I said, I just need to go in again and be like, these things you love are not going to happen. Yeah. That character you love is not in the movie. That other character you love is not in the movie. And that other character you love is going to have a very different thing happen than what happens in the book. And uh, that's okay. I'm not against any of that. It's just the first time around you're like, what is this? Yeah. Uh, but the spirit's all right. The heart is all there. The story is... Um, it, it, for all the changes, somehow the same. <laughs> it's very yeah. impressive. It's I think well that's, done. And I think that's what matters more yeah. so than anything. It's like if the if the heart that is there and the reverence for the material is there, you could feel it. Mm -hmm. And that really brings everything together because there was definitely certain omissions that I was sensitive to. And the example that I brought up, I would be curious to get your take on this in the non-spoiler review. And admittedly, it is a light spoiler for a scene in the movie. It doesn't really play into like the main, you know, plot of what's happening but I think that Dr. Sleep in particular is a very difficult book to bring to screen because so much of what goes on is internal to Abra mm. and to Dan and the one scene that seemed like a glaring example of how it works as a book and not as a movie is the watch scene when he finds yep. Yep. Yep, he yep, yep. because in the book and again light spoiler for both the book and the movie in the book it wasn't necessarily about dan saying ha ha look what i could do i yep. know where your watch is it was a major internal debate with whether or not he should tell him and he landed in a point where that watch represented more than just a thing to the doctor and he had to decide whether or not to tell the doctor about the watch and in the movie it comes across as like Oh, hey, I did this thing. I know where your watch is. Ha! That was literally the one thing. We got on the bus after the screening. I was sitting next to Eric, who had already seen it, yeah. Eric Eisenberg from Cinema Blend. And I was like, I have one complaint. Like, I have a lot of feelings, but I have one genuine complaint. What the fuck with the watch? Scene? Yeah. Like, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't track with his character. And because that... Dr. John's not the same. He, he's not a big player, so there's no reason for that to have happened. Yeah. It, it was a very strange choice. Um, but that's really, that was the one thing where I walked out and was like, I don't like that. <laughs> Mine was that and the Momo scene. I think mm. both of them could have been removed from the movie and I really thoroughly enjoyed everything else. The other thing that I walked away from, because I've seen it twice now. So it was, I will say it was nice to go in with all these high hopes and expectations as a book lover, but then to go in again, knowing exactly yeah. what I was getting. And really I walked out of the second screening further appreciating the things that I liked so much about the first viewing, but- That's one, what I expect will happen. Yeah. The one thing that I can't shake is how Badly, I want a True Not movie. I <laughs> thought that that was one of the strongest parts of Dr. Sleep. Rebecca Ferguson, as expected from the moment she was cast in that role, is so pitch perfect yeah. as Rose the Hat. And I just loved everything Flanagan did with that group from, you know, P particularly um, Crow Daddy and Andy, I thought were just brought to life so wonderfully. I would have loved to just live in that camp with them for a full two and a half hours. Yeah, I, the true knot for me when I read the book, I was like, not your best, Steven. Like, interesting concept, oh, but felt, not your scariest group. It's interesting. I fell for them so hard. No, I never have. And I, I do like them in the movie, but there's even less of their culture in the movie almost. Yeah. No, not almost, definitely. There is, there is. Um, but they also have a major thing that's cut. And um, I, like, 
I, I, I'm still, it's hard to talk. I'm still reconciling with the yeah. changes. I don't know why they aged down Andy so much. I don't feel it was necessary for the character. I don't understand. Uh, I'm still reconciling things. I noticed that, but that was something that didn't stick in my mind the entire time. It I thought, really bothered oh, me I, for some I wanna, reason. I want to look up her name just because I thought... She was good. I thought she was so good, and I think that's what made the... like. I think that's what made me go so naturally from what I knew from the book mm -hmm. to what she did in this movie. She was never the best character anyway. She sort of disappears in the book. Emily Allen Lynn. Not really, though. Mm, kind of. She's like one of the first characters you meet, and then she doesn't really do anything until like, yeah. her last. I mean, I think I think that's fair. That That's definitely fair to a point. But I thought uh, Emily Allen Lynn was excellent, and... Zahn McLaren, McLaren Love who played Crow Daddy, yes. was like, he's really something else. I remember saying almost this exact same thing when his Westworld episode yeah. came and went. He really is one of the greatest talents I've seen recently. And, you know, he's he's been around acting for a while now, but he just had, you know, between this and Westworld, two moments to really shine. And boy, did he seize those opportunities big time. He had so much chemistry with Rebecca Ferguson I couldn't handle it I know I hope we get more of him like like you said he's been acting forever but he's always in these side character roles that you can easily mm -hmm. sort of look over or, or just go isn't that the name of the documentary it's the guy from the thing um I think that's a documentary about character actors huh. uh but he's he's really special and I I, I hope that the the close delivery of Westworld and Doctor Sleep make make casting directors not they've obviously been noticing him, but mm -hmm. make him notice him for more lead roles. I will root for that as well. <laughs> the more of him we get, the better. And what a distinct face. Nobody has his face in the business. It's just yeah. like there's not another's on McLaren. It really I mean it really is true. Um, looking at the uh, the cast list here, somebody that I didn't mention and the non-spoiler that I did want to bring up is uh, Jocelyn Donahue, who I thought oh. got shafted a little in the role of Lucy, yeah, uh, not Abra's not mother. Not really it's, in the movie. <laughs> it's one of those things where I understand why Flanagan pared it down. You already have two and a half hours of material and, you know, there's only so many characters you can flesh out. And I understand why she might have been the one to go, especially with the Momo element taken out. Mm -hmm. But... She's another one that is, is so good. And I'm just waiting for her to get another House of the Devil kind of role. Mm. Another big, big, big main part in a movie. So I, I was just a little sad to see that character get shaved down just because she was the one who got the role. Oh, I, I misunderstood that sentence. Sorry, I was thinking it got shaved down because she got the role. No, I was no, like, no. I, don't, I don't think no, no, that's no. what happened. That, that's, I, if anybody else interpreted it that way, I <laughs> yeah, should I, further, I further clarify. I was, I understand why the role of Lucy isn't as prominent as it is in the book. And I think I'm okay with that in the movie that I got in what Flanagan made. I am just a little sadder about it because I really like her as an actor and I wanted to see her do more in the movie. Yeah, I get that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I corrected myself. It just took me a second. Um, I will say two more things. Please do. Maybe more. We'll I'd see like what to happens. know. I really, I was so excited to hear your thoughts. <laughs> and we, we were so good about it too, because you didn't really tell me much of anything before I saw it yeah. in terms of what you thought. And I appreciated that. But now I'm excited to like <laughs> dig into it with you. Well, my first one's real simple, which is that damn cat is so freaking cute. Oh my God, I love Azzy. Not the cat I pictured in my head when I read the book. No, me neither. At all. So much sweeter looking. Like, I just want to smooch. I almost can't remember what I pictured when I first read the book because I think after seeing the most recent Pet Cemetery, I automatically oh. just shifted to picturing uh, Azzy as church. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, I don't know. I, I pictured a darker cat, I think, but but my goodness, what a sweet little face yeah. that little angel has. I want to I wanna hug it. I am right there with you. So that's my most critical, uh, important critical review of the film. It's <laughs> a very cute cat. Um, in fact, so much so that it didn't make me forget my second point. No, <laughs> no it was tied to, it was a tied to Azzy. Um, so random. Did you happen to watch, I mean, you probably didn't, the Giants football game the other night? Oh, why would I do that? Because. Oh, because they're a cat. Did you see those clips? Yeah. <gasps> that I, I am, 
I am a big football fan now, so I enjoy games, period. Yeah. But that made it the best game I've ever <laughs> seen in my entire life. When I heard, because I was on the plane when I was watching it, when I heard, there's a cat on the field. <laughs> All of a sudden, like laser focus on the screen. And then the footage of that cat running across that football field was everything in the world that I never <laughs> knew I needed. I think that cat is more what I what I picture. Yeah, I would say that too. <laughs> That's real. Close. That that cat was busy doing other things, so they got this little cutums. Um my my other it's why we talked on Movie Talk today about movies that had a huge emotional effect on us, and this one actually did. Really? Like the um Specifically, the scenes with Azzy and with Danny helping people pass. Yeah. Lost it. I can hardly even talk about it. It's been I a get hard it. year. I get it. Yeah. And the whole, like, the way he uses ghosts. It's all in the movie. We don't end. And yeah. like, I lost it's, it. It's a, a really beautiful thing that got me in the book too it's like Stephen King writes such you know like dark terrifying things yeah. but the fact that he finds such powerful hope in what Dan does it's like you know I I had never read The Shining until very recently and I walked around thinking you know poor Danny Torrance's life like started with such misery and yeah. despair but to see someone take some th some ability like that you know obviously it's all fake and it's part of the story but, <laughs> but it's you know, in real even stuff. even to to experience him taking like this terrible experience and then making the most out of it and and finding such like a beautiful part in the world where he helps people and he gives them hope and yeah. clarity and and just like confidence and moving on to the next stage of whatever it is we are that that's something that's really always stuck with me and that's that's my favorite part of escapism in film is, is when you can get something like that that gives gives you hope and something to hold tight to when, you know, it's right smack in the middle of something that's terrifying, not just to me, but to so many people out there. I, I think that's such a beautiful addition to both the book and the movie. Mm -hmm. I, I love his story and I do think that it's a, it's a peak Flanagan story because it is about someone who finds strength in their trauma and... Uh, their greatest gift and their worst curse. Mm -hmm. But it is specifically his approach to the way that that life or not unlife after death, something after death represents more than just a sad darkness that really got to me in yeah. this one. Um, it messed me up pretty intensely, <laughs> as you can literally see. I do most certainly but understand it, that. Um, I don't know. It's just like uh, such a specifically perfect combo of what King is great at writing and what Flanagan is great at mm -hmm. rewriting for, yeah. for for film and filming and um, realizing an imagery. Flanagan is especially good at building ensembles, That's which true I am too. starting to come to appreciate more so than ever. It's like. You know, uh, for, for whatever reason, his last Stephen King adaptation comes to mind, which is a very contained, uh, contained movie in Gerald's yeah. game. But, you know, coming right off of Hill House and into this, like he really created groups of, of characters that feel like families. And, and I feel like that's so key to making you want to live in that movie. And I said this when I tweeted about uh, my first reaction to Dr. Sleep. That's something that Stephen King is great doing at doing too, is creating these stories that make me want to step into them and never <laughs> and never leave. Yeah. Like despite so much of the terror that comes from his stories, I, I'm, I'm freaking fascinated by the characters he gives me, the scenarios he creates. And I see that and I feel that in this Dr. Sleep movie. And Really, that, that was probably one of the only things that I really could have asked for. If Flanagan gave me that, I was going to be satisfied. And I, I will say, I will go back and revisit this movie over and over and over again. It's got that feeling where I miss these characters when I'm not watching them. And there's certain parts in this movie that I think he puts together so, so well that when one happens at the beginning of the movie, it's like, I'm looking forward to that. But when that comes, it goes, but then there's this next, then there's this next part and it carries me through to the end. Mm. I've been doing or attempting feebly to do NaNoWriMo, which is the National Novel Writing Month, where you're supposed to try to write 1,600 words of a novel every day. And then mm. by the end of the month, you have 
possibly the worst novel ever written, but you've written you a, novel. a novel. Um, it's so hard to just come up with a concept you want to write that much about mm -hmm. that King's ability to continually come up with worlds that, y as you say, you just want to be stuck in is honestly staggering. And I know that he gets like not all oh boo-hoo like he's the richest guy ever it, all right maybe jk rowling beats him in the writing world but like uh, he's fine <laughs> but he doesn't get a lot of the credit he deserves because he's a genre writer and because he's a pop writer and um because he sells a lot of paperbacks that mm -hmm. kind of thing you know but i i think he's a legitimate genius and and with an unbelievable capacity yeah. for creativity and world building really is wild how fast he churns out these books yeah. too while i was doing my uh my interview with rebecca ferguson at one point because we had discussed this before so it was on my mind she did mention that she's a she's a voracious reader and a big stephen king fan so i had to ask her what's the last thing that you read and she said the outsider which i mm. found funny because that was at the time the last thing i had read too and she's like well it's not that surprising because it's the most recent and i like because she's so beautiful and had me in a trance i completely forgot that the most <laughs> recent was actually the institute like oh, yeah, the yeah. outsider came out and then so soon after he released the institute and both are such full books with rich characters and like wonderful world building the town that the outsider takes place in is so important to that whole story and the facility that luke finds himself in the institute is so full and rich and vivid the fact that he can release those two in such close proximity to each other and have them be so complete i my mind cannot process it that's pretty unfathomable he's really a i would say he was a machine if he didn't have so much damn heart all the time i mean that that's the other thing. Every mm. single thing he writes is heart. Mm. Even even the stuff that ends, even the the Bachman stuff, some of which ends in very, very dark, bleak places. Sure does. <laughs> uh, even that has a whole lot of heart. Yeah. Um, I think we should maybe push pause on the Dr. Sleep commentary sure, sure, until sure. we find time to do uh, some spoiler talk, which yeah. I think is well worth it in this case. Oh, I'll say one more thing. Cliff Curtis, Billy <gasps> Freeman. Yes, yes, Not yes. the casting I ever would have pictured. No, me neither. Completely the opposite. But it works, yeah. man, it works. And it's even uh, because we lose certain characters. I think a lot mm -hmm. of that falls on a lot of the missing characters. Their work falls on Billy's shoulders yeah. and he handles it so, so well. He is also probably one of the best in the ensemble of doing the comedic relief thing. Yes. Perfect. He's perfect. perfect. And totally not what I, like I pictured, uh, what's his name? Like someone like Gene Jones from The Sacrament when yeah. I read it. Oh, interesting. Like, a, like an old kind of, yeah, yeah. like your grandpa. Yeah. Uh, so that was a really funny, like, he oh, that works. I will also say that I think his performance is one of the ones that best carries a rich history without actually saying uh -huh. all the history. It's like when it came to Billy, even though I think some of the additions you get in the book are great, I think that he manages to sell everything without having to have all that in there. So right. he should be very everything. impressed. Like Zon McLernan, make him your lead. Yes, I couldn't agree more again. <laughs> um, all right. So Dr. Sleep hits theaters November 8th, which is a Friday, but I believe there oh are some God. early screenings so in, soon. I know it's crazy. <laughs> I believe there are some evening options on the 7th if you want to check it out a little sooner than that. But that isn't the only horror movie left for the rest of the year and early next year. So I did kind of want to, you know, keep keep horror alive, which we yeah. do year round. But it feels yeah. very important now, more so than ever. <laughs> so, Haley, what is on your mind for the rest of horror in 2019, whether it's a theatrical release or something coming to a streaming service, maybe something that's available already? anything at all to keep the horror love flowing. It is an interesting time because we have really reached all the, uh, what's the word I want to say? Big ticket okay. items for the year. That we have. Um, you look at like, I don't know, I at the beginning of every year, I put together a release calendar of the, the horror movies and like, they're all done now. What? What? But of course, those are the big tick items. Yeah. Those are the ones that are scheduled out a year in advance. They're not the the indie films that are still to come. Is um is the platform still on track for this year? Because that's one that's a that good I'm, question. I'm super excited for people to see. The platform release date. 
I can't remember when we reviewed it on Movie Talk if they had dated it. It's so good, you guys. It's like, it's the perfect Netflix movie because you will enjoy it at home just as much as you would in a theater. And it's going to fuck you up. I think the last I saw of the platform was that it, Netflix had picked it up. Yeah, it's funny because every time I Google it, things come up that have nothing to do with the platform because everybody <laughs> refers to Netflix as a release platform. Oh, <laughs> so it's not, yeah. help, it's not helping me right well, now. It, eventually people will know. Um, the last headline I'm looking at is the deadline headline that said Netflix scores deal for Midnight Madness sci-fi thriller, The Platform, which is a phenomenal watch whether it comes out this year or sometime next year but that's that's one well worth keeping an eye out for and speaking of other releases that you know they could come out that isn't coming out anymore this year but could come out next year and you should still be very excited for I can't reiterate how much I love The Lodge I've seen that quite a few times now and every single time I watch it I find other little details to look out for and I just think that's a wonderfully executed mystery that I will not shake for a long, long while. Still haven't seen it. Uh, getting to the point where missing it at every festival is making me angry at it, which is not fair to the film. I understand that <laughs> feeling, though. I've had but that I'm with like, movies. Would you just sit still, you bitch, and let me see you? <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. I love how you put it that way. Uh, but I'm I'm excited for when I do eventually see. It. I just I'm not biggest goodnight mommy fan and i've heard that if you funny don't. thing i am not a big goodnight mommy fan either interesting because i have mostly heard that if you don't like that you're probably not gonna like this but i'm that's the opposite good to hear. uh i'll never forget actually i reviewed goodnight mommy with uh with christy and angie christy Puchko, mm -hmm. angie han both wonderful critics that you should read if you're not already reading their work but the two of them were super high on it and i think my problem with goodnight mommy is like I figured the whole thing out from the opening yeah. minutes of the movie and then it left me with with no surprises. Yeah. Like even though that movie is kind of batshit crazy in many respects, the fact that I figured out where it was going right at the start kind of killed the whole experience well, for me. Well, you know, that's how my first experience with us was where yeah. at the end I was like, yeah, isn't that the movie? <laughs> this is not this is not that. Okay. This is not that. Or at least I didn't find it to be like that. Um there's also uh I haven't seen this yet. I think you have, and I'm very curious to find when we get I? to it in fabric. I okay, in fabric's not for me. Yeah, I know, I know, but that doesn't never mean it's not for me. So in fabric was a, uh, it's a an eight 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 twenty four movie. Yes, and I, to be honest, I don't really even know how to describe it. It was almost <laughs> it it was it's. It's structured in an interesting way where I believe there were three stories playing out in the same movie and there's distinct breaks between the three. And I was very, very into the first one and then completely jarred when it switched gears and I was forced to be in the shoes of other characters. Huh. It didn't, it didn't work. Interesting. I'm very curious. I like Peter Strickland I saw that at Overlook. Um, and I, it's one of those ones that has like real, I don't know, pretty strong reactions whether whether my friends love it or yeah in your case aren't, I, aren't so fond of it I wasn't fond of it but there are definitely parts where I admire the craftsmanship yeah and the performances and too I'm curious because I kind of feel that way about the Duke of Burgundy which I know a lot okay. of people are heads over heel yeah, head yeah. over heels for I was like oh, I get it it's well made yeah I'm, I'm not for me not for me that's yeah. probably the reaction that I had to in fabric which I had seen at overlook interesting <laughs> um the I guess the only semi big one we have left this year, which I'm very curious about, I just don't know how much faith I have in it, is uh -huh. the new Black Christmas movie. For sure, for sure. It's like, like I don't I don't know what else they could have done to get me on board with this. It's you know, we've got a whole bunch of people attached to this that I do kind of admire their work. Mm -hmm. Um we have uh Sophia Takal directing, who I've been rooting for for a good while now. And then we've got a, a great cast, Carrie Elwes, Imogen Poots. I mean, they're they're two actors that when they attach themselves to something, it, it gives me hope in that project automatically. If they believe in it, I'm in. And yes, I'm in, and I'm going to be seeing this the second I can. But we all remember what happened with the last Black Christmas movie, and that was another movie that I thought had a phenomenal cast, and it I wasn't enjoyed very... that movie. I really enjoyed it. I go, like, not even ironically, I just enjoy that movie. 
Admittedly, I enjoyed it when I first saw it, and I think it had something to do with the age that I was at, but in yeah. revisiting it, it, it no. Fair. I, I actually good. haven't revisited it in a really long time. I, it was on TV a couple of times, and I, it's funny that, like, nothing even comes up anymore. Like, you know when you search for something on IMDb, and it's supposed to give you everything <laughs> that comes up on that title? It's like, I'm not even finding it. 2006, that's what it yes. was. Here it is. Um, and that, that had a great cast and Katie Cassidy and Mich uh, Michelle Trachtenberg, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, Lacey Chabert, like that had a great lineup and that it, casting director had a type of brunette they were very into. I know, really. <laughs> it was like a very, very clear type. But on second watch, it it, it did nothing for me. That's fair. And I, I haven't seen it probably since like 2006. Well, probably 2008 because I did watch it a few times in the okay, years okay. after. Yeah. Um, it became like for a while, I don't know. Another one that I liked at the time that may not work for me anymore was P2, another Christmas horror movie. P2, I kinda, that grew on me the more I watched uh, I, it. I, I think I still dig it. Last time I, I saw it, it was when Maniac came out because I was going to yeah. interview Frank Calhoun or Frank, think, however you say it. I think that's actually the last time I watched it, too, to get like a little refresher of his work. It still worked for yeah. me. I, I still like P2. Uh, but they definitely were of a time of Christmas horror for me, and I don't watch them... At now at Christmas the way that I did back in the early 2000s. I also feel like this Black Christmas came together so, so fast. And granted, yeah. I have no clue what was going on behind the scenes, but, you know, when, especially nowadays after, you know, when you were on Movie Talk on Tuesday, we had that discussion about IPs coming back and back and yeah. back and back. When one like this comes together so quickly that's attached to a familiar name, yeah, it gives me pause and concern. I'm, I'm curious. I'm very curious. I have zero expectation attached to it. Zero. Like, uh, my expectation levels are that it will be middling and fine. And that's, I think, a really good way to go into a movie. Yeah. Which, I mean, I'll take that right yeah. now. I, you know, this is our last studio horror release of the year, I think, right? There's nothing after it. Not unless they move something up or... Not unless you yeah. consider Cats a horror movie, which, <laughs> when it comes out, is TBD. totally, totally possible it fits in that box. But, I mean, this is a, this could be a good... If this movie yeah. is good, it could be in a very good position, just because it will have been so long since Dr. Sleep hit theaters. And, you know, around that time of year, maybe there is an interest in a horror movie. So... Who knows? I'm Could. very, very intrigued. It is one of my all-time favorite films, the original. I'm obsessed with it. If you haven't watched it recently, I can't recommend enough that you get yourself to a repertory mm -hmm. screening during the season because it will be playing somewhere. There's another one that I need a, a rewatch of. It's so good in a theater. It holds up so well. I took my mom. My mom's not a horror movie person. This was like probably five, six years ago. Um, we went to the New Beverly. It was playing during the Christmas season. And... I don't know why I or how I convinced her to go with me, but she had a blast. Like it is a very crowd pleasing mm -hmm. horror movie, and it's super contemporary. Like yeah. I I had forgotten about the abortion stuff, and I don't think I've seen that movie since that remake came. Oh out. wow, yeah, you need yeah. to rewatch. It's yeah. real good. I mean, I'll to be honest, I'll probably rewatch both before this one mm -hmm. comes out. <laughs> one uh, of those will be a guaranteed good time for you. I think it's well worth not just, you know, boxing this conversation into 2019 because sure. we do have a very big release for horror coming out at the very beginning of 2020, which is The Grudge. Oh, yeah. Have yeah. we spoken about The Grudge trailer? I know we talked about it on Movie Don't Talk, but you weren't it. here for that. It's not. I've been a going. Have you watched the trailer? Yeah, I liked it. It's very, very good. I liked it a, a lot. A very good trailer. Yep. I don't know why people were being bitchy online about it because it was dope. Well, what were people bitching about? That it was too many jump scares and like, I don't even know what you're talking oh, about because wow. it was super moody. I, that's, that's, I think, what my big takeaway was yeah. is just how uncomfortable the whole thing made me feel without relying on jump scares. I mean, I don't remember it, you know, beat by beat at this point. Maybe there was <laughs> a jump scare or two, but the whole thing just made me feel very unsettled. Yeah, I liked it a lot. I'm not surprised. I have been low key in the grudge is going to be excellent camp for a while because I love both of Nicholas Peck's films. Um, yeah. Eyes of My Mother and Piercing. Love them. I haven't seen Piercing, but <coughs> Eyes of My Mother, I think I put in the just not for me category. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I, I am 
desperate for someone to like rekindle this the style and structure of j-horror because mm -hmm. to me it's some of the scariest movies ever made that for my personal i don't know i guess maybe i'm deeply afraid of ghosts in a way that i'm not willing to process because i didn't feel afraid in the hotel that's supposedly full of ghosts but ghost movies fuck me right yeah. the fuck up like <laughs> Fuck me up. Oh, God, we're on video now. I forgot. Sorry, kids. I will work on that. I'm used to podcast mouth. Um, I mean, just destroy me. My like in my whole life, I can't think of anything that's ever scared me more than the first time I saw the ring. Yes, I saw the ring before mm -hmm. I saw Ringu. I was like a 13 year old white girl in Orange County. But my bitch best friend. The beginning of the movie where it cuts to the girl in the closet with mm -hmm. her face all messed up. Yeah, yeah. That, like, I was done. I, I was like, I'm devastated and terrified. Let me leave this film. And she was like, it doesn't get scarier than that. Okay, it doesn't, but it gets pretty close for the whole movie. Okay. It's, fu it's fun for me hearing you talk about what scared you when you were oh. younger. Because, like, I, I don't have that. And I wanted it. Oh, no, that destroyed me. I, I like covered my tv when she slept over that night we like put a sheet over it <sighs> um that year in school everybody was doing seven days prank calls like constantly so you know how a lot of people say that horror movies are scary for kids but then as you get older you wind up with more adult fears so that stuff mm -hmm. becomes less scary or at least, you know, like supernatural, not real horror type things. I think I had like the most vivid memory I have of something keeping me awake at night was the idea of there being a fire in the house. Huh. So I feel like because I thought about all of that, mm -hmm. I never expected something to crawl out of my TV or or That's anything anything like that to happen. I had also just lost my father, so I was exploring ideas of like afterlife and ghosts and things in a huh. way that had never occurred to me before oh, that's so i think that might be part of why it's something that's always messed with me uh i started Could be. i i couldn't even watch those kinds of movies until he passed so like i had an onslaught of terrifying films wow. right after his death so i was like rules are off i'm watching everything huh um and those particular like i go like okay Murder movies are scary in a different way because that can totally happen. Like you can dead ass get murdered. Just yeah. read the news. Happens every day. That's a different kind of thing. The the like afterlife, it's the unknowability of it. And then the 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 shock, the fact that she was shocked so much that she died of her shock. That like really got to me. Okay. Uh, because that's that's confronting something you might never have believed could be true. You know what I want you to watch? So mm. I'm bringing this up because recently I hosted a post-screening Q&A for two YouTube learning shows. One of the hosts actually came on Movie Talk recently, Jake Roper, who is uh, hosting the show Could You Survive the Movies? Good fun, go watch it. The okay. other one is Michael Stevens, who hosts the show Minefield, which has been running for a long time, but they did a Halloween special on fear. And specifically, it's I think it, it was subtitled What's the Scariest Thing? And he was on the hunt for the the thing that would scare everybody no matter what and he creates a really interesting visual of like a web of fear and how it all connects to to death and how things are just mm -hmm. like a web attached to it but it, it's a fascinating exploration of things that are in us from the very beginning that we're prone to be afraid of but also you know things that you're conditioned to be afraid of mm -hmm. That it's sounds very interesting. I, really, it's probably one of the best pieces of YouTube content I think I've ever seen. And I, I think it, I really do think it's endlessly fascinating. In general, you seem way more afraid of real life things than I am. I am, I am not afraid of very really much. much in real life. It's, it's for me, it's, it's the unknowable, the, it's the impossible and like something that could break my whole concept of belief is what terrifies me. I'm more afraid of very real things that could harm people I love. It's like, I'm not afraid of me being caught alone in a burning you building. You're terrified of the dentist. How's he gonna hurt the people oh, well, you that's, love? That's that's completely different. I'm talking about like, I mean, what's what's a what's a rational fear versus an irrational fear? But it's like the dentist, It's yeah. that's, that's more of like a phobia, you know? And I do have, I, I misspoke, I am 
deeply terrified of snakes. That's my one yeah. real life thing that genuinely scares the shit out of me. It's like the dentist, the dentist keeps me up at night, but in a different sense. <laughs> you know what I mean? You kind of know what I mean? It's, di- it's a difficult thing to articulate. Weirdly, like, flirty. You know, the dentist keeps me up at night, but in a oh different God. way. <laughs> when you put it that way, it's kind of funny. The, de- no, the dentist freaks me out too. Yeah. But that's, that's not something that I think about the same way as I do like my real, my real fears. Yeah. Things that freaking rattle me to my core and not only can keep me awake at night, but that I carry around with me on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Well, in that you're just speaking about like the mortality of your friends and family. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. That's my other real life fear, but that's just like lifelong chronic depression. See, horror can can just follow you <laughs> everywhere you go. That's You're out. Right. Oh God, oh, that's, that's so, why, disturbing. so disturbing. That's my belief on why why it's so popular because it takes all that bundled up fear of, for yourself or for the people you love and goes, why don't you express that very safely for ninety minutes? Well, I think that's why I've always kind of gravitated towards horror movies because it's it's interesting. It's very interesting to me processing those fears in a safe place. Yeah, I like that. Quite a bit. I do too. And it's, it's, uh, I think it's the ones that push it out of a safe place that are the ones that scared me. Like, like Lake Mungo took that somewhere huh. where I was like, that's devastating and I'm not okay. I'm trying to think of what the last one was that followed me out of the theater mm-hmm. and not in a fun way. You know, what's funny actually, I think it's Martyrs, Ooh. the end of that. Not a lot of fun in that movie. That, that like deeply upset yeah. me for a very, very long time. I, and it's That's rough. And it, it's weird because I think that speaks more to like the fear that you express versus the immediacy in, in you know, the real world as we know it. Like perspective shattering type yeah. fear. Yeah, that was I could a, see that. That was a perspective shattering type of fear that, I mean, it didn't just knock me on my ass for the couple of hours after I saw the movie. I could not shake that final conversation yeah. for a very, very long time. And still to this day, forget about rewatching it. If I just read a transcript of that conversation, I get sad. Mm-hmm. That's interesting too, because when I think about Lake Mungo, it's very similar. Like it, it, it didn't like shatter my beliefs, but it pushed my concept of how ghost stories can work and like how deeply, deeply sad they can be. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it never has left me. Whereas something like hereditary, which caused a very visceral, primal, physical reaction while I was in the theater, it didn't challenge my my ultimate belief or my ultimate experience of life and death yeah. in a way that it has haunted me. I, I can think about hereditary at night and not be afraid. Yeah. If I think about Lake Mungo, I get the chills. That's like, I think the only thing I could put in that category is martyrs. Yeah, so it's a top tier. That's really the only one that when I think about it, I get very, very upset. You know what I think about and get very, very upset? Other movies, not horror movies, like like Stepmom. Oh, yeah, I don't watch that. That's, when I think that's about nasty, and, and, nasty business. And Marley and Me. When I think I about want those movies, I get very upset. That is a very <laughs> unsafe way to explore my emotions. That is like Haley's going to be crying for yeah. seven hours. Oh, I did. Yeah. I'll never forget it. We were in uh, Longboat Key on a family trip and saw Stepmom. And mm-hmm. I cried for, I, not straight, but there were points weeks after when I thought about that movie that I would cry. And I had the same thing with Marley and me. So yeah, those I movies can't. are crossed off my list for life. No weepies for these ladies. No. I don't want any part of it. None I, of that. I'll never forget seeing Titanic for the first time. And oh. it was the first time I processed like <laughs> um, how many people can die in a disaster. I, it had never occurred to wow. me how thousands or hundreds of people can die in an instant. And mm-hmm. I was like, my parents were freaking out because I was screaming huh. sobbing in the parking lot and they're like Leonardo DiCaprio's fine I was like I don't care about him I wonder if I was all just, those people died I, I wonder if I was just like in a warped way conditioned to be able to accept that because mm. I had watched so many uh disaster movies at that time I had seen them but that was the first one that for some reason I, well because of the probably the emotionality with which so many of those people were in doubt like that couple hugging each other yeah the waters rise there's a lot of like emotional torment there in is. that movie that makes you realize that every single person who died was an actual person yeah and it 
broke me. I definitely like, didn't fully me. wrap my brain around that until I was a little older. I, but it is very upsetting when you think about a, that. It was a full, full public breakdown. Huh. Yeah. God, I must have seen Titanic in theaters like 10 times. Oh, and then I watched it a million times. Yeah. Yeah. That, that <laughs> was, uh, I, I owned, I think my parents might still have it, a bootleg VHS of Titanic. Nice. One of those ones where like, you're watching the screen on a camcorder and you see people like get up and go <laughs> yeah. to the bathroom. In the Old school of it. piracy. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that's like a, a cherished item mm -hmm. now. And because I'm very old, like my, my other Titanic memory would be only watching the first VHS cassette because then it, it all got sad once you put in the I second know, one. I know. <laughs> I, I, I'll remind me to tell your story okay. after. <laughs> I'm just not, not going to put it out there on the internet. Um, can uh, This is a terrible transition, but I did want to ask you one question about The Grudge because the second yeah. anybody sees a movie plopped on a January 3rd release date, assumptions are automatically made about that movie. Sure. So why do you think they gave it that release date? And is it like, does that give you any concern at all that it's not good? Kind of. I mean, I don't know. I, the, uh, the industry is moving more towards a 12 month calendar anyway. Yeah. We have seen that horror movies can do well in those time frames. Escape Room has a sequel coming. Um, I've also seen that they can totally not do well. Mm -hmm. um, Happy Death Day is not becoming a trilogy. I I think that the studio does not have faith in it. I think that is what it says when you put something on January 3rd. I also don't mm. think that what the studio has faith in and what I like are generally all that aligned. Does it mean anything to you that this is a Sony movie? I'm just thinking about their past releases because when yeah. you said when you said that they this might be a sign that they have no faith, mm -hmm. it automatically brought me back to our Slenderman conversations, which that's Oof. justifiably a movie to have absolutely yes, no faith worst in. Worst case scenario. Just, you know, I think about what Sony is releasing at this point in time yeah. and it's it's kind of like one dud after the next. Well, was an escape room Sony? Escape room was Sony. So maybe, uh, but maybe based on the success of Escape Room, the early release date actually means they have tremendous faith in it. That's wonder, my optimistic spin. I wonder if Escape Room might have been in, in like the Screen Gems arm though. Mm. And I wonder if that does make- I think make, you might be right. I wonder if that makes a little bit of a difference because Screen Gems is largely focused on genre content. Before I- I messed that up. I don't think it was actually because I'm not finding anything on Wikipedia about Screen Gems. Maybe not. Maybe not. It sounded so right. You could have totally didn't sold it? me. I know. I, but like, <laughs> you know, I can't lie about anything. Escape Room IMDb. Man, I really even feel like I can see the Screen Gems logo. I know. Amazing what the brain is capable of. It's also because like that feels like such a Screen Gems movie too. But, you know, I, lo I look at that that release date and personally after that trailer gave me more faith than I had before because also this was a movie that's pushed back and usually yeah. that does sound the alarms in these kinds of conversations but I looked at that release date and I thought it was a very smart move because in recent years we have seen and I'm not even just talking about escape room levels because escape room opened up with 18 million dollars I'm talking about like big money yeah. bigger money for a horror release the first weekend of the new year so I thought that they purposely positioned it there. Interesting. I could also be biased uh, based on some old reports I remember reading that basically suggested the test screening results were not very good. Mm. Uh, but once again, what test screening groups think and what I think are not aligned. Well, what will test, test uh, screening audiences think of Eyes of My Mother and uh, Piercing? 100%. It, they're not crowd pleasers. No. So maybe this is a really challenging movie that'll freak people out. It's like, I wonder what people thought about the test screenings of Hereditary or Midsummer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think A24 is as big in the test screening business. And yeah, that's well, part of what makes yeah, them yeah, so special. Exactly. But, um, uh, but yes, I totally see your point and agree. Under production companies, they have listed Columbia Pictures. Okay. So it doesn't look like uh, Screen Gems was involved in Escape Room. But let me look at The Grudge very quickly and see what's up with that what's one. What's up with you, Grudge? I don't know. I'm God, excited. I want it to be good. So, but funny thing, 
Grudge is a Screen Gems movie. So huh. it's almost like a reverse of the point that I was yeah. trying to make <laughs> while being misinformed. Well, but I also, I'll also uh, to, to take the spotlight off of misinformation, uh, the cast is really hard to see that cast and think that there wasn't something in the script of value. Yeah. It's, you know, Andrea Riseborough, John Cho, um, who am I forgetting? Lynn Shea, Lynn Shea, obviously. Jackie Weaver. Uh, Jackie Weaver. That's it. Okay, so like, all due respect to Lynn Shea, who is a goddamn gem. She really is. She makes a lot of horror movies. She does. So when she makes a horror movie, that's not like a stamp of approval of quality to me. That means that movie's going to have one badass performance in yes, it. Yes, yes. At least. But somebody like... The combo of Jackie Weaver, Andrea Riseborough, and John Cho, that's a lot of people who don't yeah. do a ton of horror all in one spot. That makes me very curious. They're they're sort of like acclaimed, mm -hmm. you know? And I uh, that's that's a that's a hell of a cast. I'm with you on that. Yeah. I got hopes. I got hopes. I've got hopes. Not high hopes, but I do have hopes. I'm pretty pretty high hopes. Dangerous way to go into a January release. I know. I, I do, I do, and I just so desperately want someone to bring back the the stylings of J Horror. Um, I, the new ring movie, wasn't it? Oh my God. <laughs> it just was not it. I can't talk about rings. <laughs> oh, Don't not even, even that one. Well, that one we should never discuss. I mean the, the, the latest Japanese one that I caught at Fantasia. Oh my God. I totally Sadako. forgot about that. Yeah, it's not the move. All right. It's not the move. All right. But you know what? If you are suffering from a Halloween hangover, yes. we, we have found some bright spots <laughs> in the future of horror on the big screen. So Keep your fingers crossed. We could have some good things coming out in the next couple of months. And if you're not inclined to go see something in the movie theater, seriously, like check out Shudder. Yes. An endless stream of really great content. I, so much good stuff there. I had the profoundly delightful experience of showing two of my friends in Portland one cut of the dead. Still on my list. I have to watch you're it. You're unbelievable. I know. Uh, um, I, they of course, loved it. There's nobody who doesn't love it, but it was my first time ever having to show it to somebody who has not seen it when I have seen it. Mm -hmm. And if you have watched it, and if you guys have watched it, you will know that re-watching the first 30 minutes of the movie when you know what everything means and trying not to laugh hysterically is almost impossible. Oh, I can't wait. I straight up lost it at one point. I was like trying so hard to keep it together because they don't know what's going on yet. And I fucking broke at one point and I bust out laughing. I was like, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I can't the first fucking opportunity do it. And I, had to I walk get. out of the room. I'm going to watch it the first time. Yeah. <laughs> right now, I'm in the middle of a succession binge, which I'm okay. loving. And then um, I also have a lot of FYC stuff to catch up on. Sure. I just watched Dolomite, which, yes, please go see that if you haven't already. Mm -hmm. You can watch it on Netflix right now. And then I also have to watch The King, too. That's fine. I, I you can throw all your titles at me. I've been telling you to watch this for I like know, literally I know. a year and, and a half. I've had I've had the opportunity yeah, too you because have. it was at Overlook and I forgot what reason what the reason was Pretty that sure we it was didn't a New Orleans style hangover and or party, which is fair I enough. I functioned very fair well enough. for being hungover. I think that one specifically, you were like. It was not an option. Yeah, I think there was a, there was a conflict with something that I had to see for some sort of reason. It's not the story I, I don't remember, know. but I love really? it. Really? Yeah, I remember it being like a Matt and Alicia fucky type story. Like the partying was too intense. Okay. I'd be surprised. We have to discuss this. Remind <laughs> me to tell you about that and my Titanic story after we wrap because okay. we gotta go right now oh yeah I, we are down to yeah, a minute this is it i hope you guys enjoyed this episode of the witching hour as always uh Haley is busy churning out some wonderful horror content on collider.com where can everybody find your work well you could certainly start on collider.com and you can also follow me on twitter at Haley fouch and you can also follow me on instagram at haystack mcgroovy which is where you will find all my fun stories from my fun trips mm -hmm. to places like the stanley you don't want to miss that and i'm on twitter and instagram at pnemroff keep an eye on collider.com and the collider interview youtube channel because i've got a whole bunch of doctor sleep content coming your way through the weekend that's it we're out of here you have officially survived the witching hour <laughs> <laughs>